Thanks very much. So at FT Labs, we have an HTML5. We have an HTML5 app, and over the last two years, we've spent a lot of time dealing with a lot of web performance-related issues. And dealing with web performance can be quite a daunting thing to do. It's, it can feel like a battle that you can never win or a task that is never complete. <laughs> and I think that uh, at conferences like Velocity, you often see amazing innovation in trying to uh, fix some of these, these performance challenges that we have in the web platform. And I'm always amazed by the level of ingenuity that people display in trying to work around some of these problems. So maybe today you'll sit in some of these talks at Velocity and think, this is, this is an amazing technique, but I could never convince anyone in my company to do this. I can't convince my boss that we should spend time doing this. And I think that's actually a challenge for a lot of companies. And most teams have this problem of trying to prioritize performance. Um, and there's no single right way to do that. So as your, your products get more complicated, as your solutions get more decoupled, uh, doing even the most basic performance optimization becomes uh, more and more of a challenge. So at the FT, we've, we've come up with an extraordinary range of performance solutions over the last couple of years, ranging from the basic kind of uh, common best practices to the weird and wonderful and wacky and esoteric. So, you know, from things like concatenating our JavaScript and our CSS, we do it on build so that we can deploy static resources to our production web servers, to creating open source tools like FastClick, which removes the 300 millisecond touch to click delay on touch screens and gives us an even footing with native apps in terms of interaction performance. Um, we started caring recently about layout boundaries allowing us to bear down on the amount of the DOM that the browser has to reconsider when we make changes, so that whenever we make a small change to the DOM, we can minimize the re-rendering time. And because we're building applications that we now expect to go for hours or even days between page refreshes, we need to care more and more about memory and ensuring that we don't leak memory. So we're using heap snapshots and profiles to ensure that we're cleaning up after ourselves and removing any detached to DOM, bits of DOM tree. And then there's the, the weird and, and, and wonderful things, like we, we, we convinced the browser that we were storing UTF-16 when actually we were storing ASCII so that we could get double the amount of data into local storage that it would otherwise allow us to store. <laughs> and we want our applications to work offline, so we use the HTML5 app cache. But the app cache is, is a terrible design for a lot of the kind of production use cases that real life companies actually have. So we come up with workarounds like embedding an, I, uh, an iframe, a hidden iframe in every page of our site that loads a kind of sacrificial app cache loader page, and then the iframe deletes itself once the app cache is installed. And even downloading all our images as base64 encoded strings, um, which enables us to flexibly concatenate multiple images into the same HTTP response without spriting them. It also means we can store our images in local storage or any other string-based uh, JavaScript um, data store. And most importantly, it means that we can decouple the process of downloading the image from the process of decoding it so that we can defer the decoding until we're actually ready for that image to be displayed. And hopefully this is something which browsers will enable us to do without these kind of crazy hacks at some point in the future. And of course, we also take advantage of hardware acceleration so that all of the transitions and animations that we have in our applications are smooth. And uh, Chrome recently added this amazing new tab to Chrome DevTools that enables you to see uh, an amazing visual representation, visualization of the GPU layers in your page. So you can see which parts of your UI have been moved onto a different layer, and, and therefore which parts of your page you can animate cheaply. And that's a great tool for starting to get a, a much better understanding of the performance characteristics of your, your animations. So there's a huge variety of, of different kinds of performance work that you can do, and if you uh, if you don't do it in a directed way, you could even spend all of your time working on performance. 
So, um, but I think in many cases, performance is, is, is easier than this. It's, it's obvious, it's kind of staring you in the face. It's things which you just simply need to make time to do, or which you need to carve out uh, space in your workflow to make sure they get done. So here's an example of um, a blog we have called Alphaville. We've, we've been running this blog for about seven years. And until recently, it had share um, widgets on every story. So you would have 30 stories on a page, and each one would have five or six third-party served um, share widgets. And I figured, this is probably what's causing this page to be really slow. But of course, you know, editors and writers like having um, the ability for readers to share content. It obviously work, works really well from a marketing perspective. So we don't want to remove it. But we also don't want to spend a lot of time redesigning the way we do sharing um, without knowing exactly what we're going to get out of that. So I thought, well, actually, what we really need is just a hacky, simple, uh, really uh, downright dirty way of proving what the gain is. Let's work out how much performance is on the table here. Um, so I just blocked a whole load of host names, reloaded the page, did some measurements, and worked out what the effect is. And the effect, it turns out, is dramatic. Um, so then the question is, how do we how do we present that? How do we phrase that, that improvement in performance so that we can make the case for spending time to design an alternative sharing solution? So we could say, well, you know, it's 78% faster or whatever, and that sounds great, but does it make that performance gain personal to the person you are trying to convince? So I thought it probably didn't, and um, so our approach was to do a video. So we made a video, a side-by-side -side comparison of the site with and without those social plugins. Um, so without social plugins, you can see it's already faster. The task here is to scroll down to the bottom of the page, pick the very last article, and then wait for that subsequent page to load. We've actually slowed down the network intentionally to exacerbate the problem, but the without social plugins were done in 19 seconds. The other one is really struggling to scroll, and that's because you've got all of these third-party widgets that are frantically rearranging the DOM to their liking in a very disorganized and decoupled way and causing this um, interference with the, um, the smoothness of the scrolling. So we end up finishing around 42 seconds. That's pretty terrible, and it demonstrates very, very effectively and far more powerfully than any statistic could just how much gain you've got there, how much potential there is for an improvement in performance. Now, sometimes there is no smoking gun that you can point at a particular part of your your site and say, this is the thing I need to improve. And that was the case with The Economist, which is another one of our customers. This is another one of our projects. We, we, we do the HTML5 app for reading The Economist. And so in this case, we sat down with the product team and we, we figured out what are the, the metrics that define a great user experience for Economist readers. And we came up with four things which we wanted to try and focus on and improve. So we knew that when we started working on performance, we, these were the specific four metrics that we wanted to, to reduce. And we did really well on particularly time to article visible. Um, and I can draw you a chart to show you that you know, when we look at this across a number of browser platform combinations, particularly on devices that are fairly slow, like the BlackBerry Playbook, um, we're seeing a massive, massive reduction in the time it takes to um, render an article. But again, this is a relatively clinical uh, definition of, of the results. And you know, this isn't making the point very powerfully or personally to someone who might want to then be invested in the time it takes to, to solve this properly. So we thought, OK, let's just get two identical BlackBerry playbooks and load up the software on both of them, one with the old code, one with the new code, tap them both at the same time, and just show exactly how much faster it is. And when you're in a meeting room and you have both of these devices that you can literally pick up and play with, you're definitely, definitely want to, gonna, gonna want to use the top one. And nothing after this is going to make convince you that the bottom one is a good reading experience. So whether or not you, you feel like you need uh, specific metrics that you're targeting with your performance work, and maybe you go even further and define real user monitoring-based metrics around user engagement, or you go the other way and you simply identify really obvious smoking gun type things which you just need to find the time to work on. I think 
The most important thing of all is simply making performance part of your workflow and making it personal for everyone in your team. And that's you, your team, your boss, your whole company. Make them all invested in improving the performance of your application. And everyone can find a different way of doing that. This is mine. Um, and if you don't have one, maybe you'll find one at Velocity today. So thank you very much for listening, and enjoy the conference.